It's all about Jesus, his sinless life as both fully God and fully man, his death on a cross, and his resurrection that triumphed over death forever. But how does the gospel speak to issues like justice, adoption, disability, gratitude, growth, and generosity? How do we act in line with the truth of the gospel? How are we following the gospel line? Well, good morning. How are you all doing? Good, good, good. Well, again, my name is Jason, as Jeremy shared. Um, and before I get going, I want to take a quick moment and just uh, say thank you to Jeremy, um, to the leadership of the church, to every person who steps up into this space and is a, has the opportunity to preach. I'm honored to be invited into this space and to be with you to bring God's word to you this morning. But a year ago, we, we transitioned to North Point. And uh, pastors have a funny thing about, we have a lot of funny things about ourselves, but um, here's one of them. We oftentimes will go and visit another church and what happens to us uh, is, is interesting because we walk through a door and it turns into an evaluation mode. Like there's a switch and you get in, and this is something, uh, honesty, I get in the door and I go, where's the communicate card? I want to fill it out and then see how long it takes them to get back with me, right? And so like that's going to be the test of how great this church is. Or um, we get in and, and we, I, we evaluate, I love production stuff, so I'm like evaluating all the screens and how it all works and we just get in evaluation mode and then we look at other pastors and we start evaluating evaluating ourselves based on the other pastor. And you just go through this thing. It's this crazy part of being a pastor. But a year ago, when we started coming to North Point, uh, just so blessed by the teaching of this church and by the leadership. Because I'm telling you, from day one, the Lord said, Jason, stop evaluating. And I started being fed. And I needed it. I was in a place where I needed to be fed. I needed to be refreshed. I needed to be cared for. And North Point did it. So, Jeremy, thank you so much for your leadership, for your teaching, your heart for the word, and for everyone that comes up on this stage uh, just to give us the presence of Jesus. It's such a, such a good thing. Um, so, thank you. I, I want to share a little bit more about me. As Jeremy shared, I've been had the opportunity to work with our high school students here um, for the last few months. And my goodness, we've got some incredible incredible young students and young men and women at this church that God is going to do some incredible things through. And it has been an honor to, to work with them. And, and I've had limitations to that, but just to be able to teach and to get to know them a little bit and to see them towards what's next, um, which has been incredible. So it's been so good. And part of what I do, I work with an organization called Pulse, not the radio station here in Des Moines, another organization. Um, and we're out of Minneapolis, Minnesota, and we exist to make Jesus known. And so we're an evangelistic outreach organization. We got all over the world to tell people about Jesus, but then we also are raising up the next generation to be evangelists, to take the gospel out to the world, which is those two things together. It's why I, I love being a part of what I get to be a part of with Pulse, is to see another generation raising up. Uh, the evangelists around us in our world are passing away. That generation is moving on. Um, and you can name the list of names. Impulses around it to help raise up that next generation and to see them go out into all the world. And it's, it's an awesome thing. And so I'm honored to be a part of that. I am passionate about the next generation uh, as we move through that. Another important thing about me is my family and probably the outside of my walk with Jesus, the most important thing about me. So I want to introduce you to them um, through photo because they're not all here. Uh, my daughter's right there, the one closest to me. If you can't tell, I'm the guy on the left. Um, and so next to me is my daughter, Sydney. She's 18. She's finishing her senior year at Waukee Northwest High School. And then next to her is Taylor. Uh, she's 12, almost 13, uh, and is at Trail Ridge in Waukee. Um, and then next to Taylor is my amazing, amazing wife, who as of tomorrow has put up with me for 24 years, um, which is incredible. And it's, it's crazy to think about um, being married. And some of you have been married uh, longer than you've known each other, right? So it's, you, we're getting to that place that almost half of our lives we've been married to one another and which is incredible it's like a concept I'm still trying to get kind of in my head and going wow 
I've known you and been married to you more than half of my life almost, which is great. Um, but it's just incredible. I love my family. They bring me so much joy uh, and, and laughter. And it's incredible to take an iPhone and I think stand in a construction zone and find some really cool looking weeds and make it look great, right? And so, you know, to all the people out there that do digital photography, like, good job. Uh, it's so great. Another thing I need to tell you about myself, and this one's going to be a little bit weird. Uh, I do not like the gym. Um, I don't like going to the gym. How many guys are, are gym rats? You like you love going to the gym. You love lifting weights. You love running on a treadmill. Um, which it, treadmills are interesting to me. You get on and you start running and you never actually get anywhere. Um, and so I, I don't quite get it. But I don't. I don't love the gym. Here's the reason why I don't love the gym. It's not that I don't like to exercise or like to be uh, in physical physically good shape. Uh, I just, I don't like the idea of people looking at me while I'm trying to exercise. It just feels really weird. And I know we probably all feel that when we go to the gym, but man, that voice in my head is everyone's looking at you and like saying, well, mm, no, you're not going to be able to lift that. You might want to slow that treadmill down just a little bit. You're about to go off the back end of it. Like I just feel like people are watching me when I go to the gym. And so I just don't, I don't love it. I tried it with a friend for a while and we were like going a couple times a week and I just, I stopped going and it wasn't because I didn't want to wake up in the morning, although that may have had a big part of it. Um, but it was just, I just don't like people watching me. And there's that one part of the gym, you know, the one, the one little section of the gym um, where the, the incredible folks who are just, are absolutely into physical fitness, and they have so many muscles that it's hard to imagine, like, how did you choose the shirt that you're going to rip yourself out of today? Like, it's, and I look at that, I'm like, I will never be invited into that crowd. That will never be my space. And then that makes me feel even more self-conscious. I'm a, God gave me a small stature, and that's a beautiful thing. And, but I will just, I will never look like that. Like, that's not my thing. But then I had a thought. I wonder if I could run out to Target or Walmart and find one of those t-shirts, right, that has the muscles printed on it. Right. I'm going to slide that over my little scrawny body and I'm going to walk into that part of the gym and I'm going to like strut a little bit and just say, hey, I fit in. And I think every one of those people would not look at me and say, well, yeah, you belong here. Yeah, you, this is, this is your, there's, go, go lift that. I'm like, I'm lifting that, you know, but there's this idea sometimes I get like, if I could just dress myself up, maybe I would fit in there. And I feel that at the gym. And I say all that, and that's a weird thing about me, because I think that's what Paul's getting to in our passage today. That sometimes we think and believe that if we just do something to ourselves externally, if we add things to us from an external standpoint or perspective, that will change and that will fit in, that it will be what qualifies us to be a part of this or that. Muscles are an interesting thing. And if you're a doctor or OT or you just know a lot about muscles, I, I'm not that, I'm a pastor. I can counsel you all day long. I can't tell you about how muscles grow. But let's give it a try. Um, so inside of your skin, inside of your body, you have these things called muscles. You all do, believe it or not, they're there. Um, and then when those muscles move and they stretch and they exercise themselves, they begin to separate and have microfiber tears, which sounds horrible. Like, again, why would you want to exercise and tear things? That doesn't sound good. But they tear and they create this space. And then this other part of that is how God created you. These uh, proteins, amino acids, they, they start to fill in that space. And as that space is filled and your muscle grows upon itself. It's a really beautiful part of, of your, your body and your physical form. But the cool thing about that is it's already within you. <laughs> that you have all the ability to grow the muscle in your body because of what's already in your body. Now, you can add some things to help that along, eat, drink the largest, ginormous protein shake possible, um, maybe have some uh, other aids or gummy bears that have like nutrients in them or whatever else, could help it along. But even without those, your body is created to grow and be strengthened from something that is already within you. You don't take muscle from, I, don't, I can't walk up to the gym and say, hey, brother, I like your muscles. Can I have some of those? And like take them and like just put them on. It doesn't work that way. As many, does, like it doesn't work to put on a t-shirt that's got muscles printed on it. It's not going to change what's inside of me. God's already given that to me. And Paul is addressing that here in Galatians 5. 
Helping change the conversation to say, there's this stuff going on that you're beginning to listen to, but you need to understand and get back to the reality of what is different for us because of the gospel. Because of what Jesus has done through his death and his resurrection, there's a new thing going on. And so I want to invite you guys to turn to Galatians 5. We're going to start in verse 13. If you're using the Bible and the chairs in front of you, it, I believe it's on page 946. And some context here is that, and we've heard this in previous sermons in the series, is that Paul is addressing some false teachers that are bringing in these concepts of saying that the law is something that we still need to adhere to and abide by, that we need to follow through with some of these areas. And here, there, Paul is addressing this issue of circumcision. So essentially, there's this external uh, act or, or response that we need to make that's going to change either maybe what qualifies us or what gets us in. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. That's not the case. So let's look at Galatians 5. I'm going to start in verse 13, and we're going to go right through the end of the chapter. And I'm going to read the whole thing. You ready? You, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, and factions, and envy, and drunkenness, and orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let's keep in step with the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. So Paul comes in recognizing there's this battle, these false teachers that are speaking. It's like, you need to adhere to the law. If you're going to be part of this, if you're going to be part of this movement of God that we say, this is all what it's about. It's an external thing that you need to do so that you are in. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. It's not about that because the law was fulfilled through Jesus his death and his resurrection was the fulfillment of the law. Therefore, the law is not something that you adhere to any longer. You align yourself with Christ. And that's where it stands. And he's like, out of that should come a beautiful response of loving your neighbor, loving others. So because Christ, what Christ has done for you you are able to live in a way that takes that love that he's given you and give it to others. And he's recognizing that there's this battle that he calls it, this, this fight, this contrast that's going on that you're eating yourselves up over it. And you're biting one another and you're devouring one, you're fighting over this thing that isn't a thing. And Paul wants to lead this church to say, you need to grow. You need to see what God is going to do. You need to see the presence of the Spirit in you. That growth isn't something that is going to come from a result of what you do externally. Growth is a result of what is already within you. And it's going to grow through you. And then as it grows through you and in you, it's going to overflow from you. And that's the beautiful thing the nature of the Spirit in our lives. 
And he walks through this and he starts diving into this more. But if you live by the Spirit, if you led by the Spirit, these things will fall away from you. And then he does this thing. He contrasts these two issues. Now, there's a place that we can read this scripture sometimes and we can go, okay, verses 19 through 21, this is what I should not do. Which, yeah, don't do these things, church. Let me, let me say that. Like, don't live this way. But in this passage, Paul's not calling you to flee or to rid yourself of these things. He's just making you aware of this is what life in the flesh looks like. If you weren't noticing it, here, notice it. He's not specifically coming out and, and saying, rid yourself of these, flee from these. He does that in other letters. He speaks to the Colossian church that way. He speaks to Timothy, his apprentice that way. He's like, you need to run from these things. Get them out of your life. But here he just wants to highlight life in the flesh isn't good. The word flesh here in Greek is, is sarx, S-A-R-X. And I, I think it's really interesting to me that the word itself sounds like a really horrible disease. Because it is. Life in the flesh is a horrible disease. It's ripping and biting and tearing us apart. It's something that's, that's not good for us. But it's a reality in that contrast against life in the spirit. Which again, Paul's not writing this out as here's what you should do. You should be Love, loving and, and joyful and peaceful and patient and kind. Now, again, yes, <laughs> let those things be a part of your life. But know that there's nothing that you can do on your own to, to create that. You can't slide on the t-shirt of joy and say, mm, I'm joy today, look at me. You can't slide on that t-shirt of kindness like, I'm, I'm getting the kindness bell today, I'm getting star that's just not how it works. And Paul's not even leading us in that. He just wants to highlight for us this contrast and this battle that you've got this fleshly side that is trying to eat and devour you. But inside of you, the presence of the Holy Spirit, there's this amazing quality of growth that is this fruit that is this, this expounding in you already. And when you live and are led and walk in the Spirit, is naturally going to overflow from you. But yet we live in a world that says these are things we need to add to our lives. Multi-billion dollar industry of self-help out there. You can get on Amazon right now on your phone. Don't, pay attention. Um, but, and, and you can, I have no idea, I didn't even look it up, how many books out there are going to tell you, here's the five great things you can do to be a better human being. Right? It's all around us. People are making millions of dollars off of this concept. And there's a difference between self-help, which means I can do it all on my own and solve the problem of my life. Which, anyone tried? Is it working? That's like putting on the t-shirt with muscle. It's not going to work. And then there's self-care. Self-care says, I know I need support and I need people around me and I need words of encouragement around me, and I can come to church, that's part of that. I, I maybe find a good resource to remind me not of what I can become, but who God is. And it's gonna start to be a part of that journey within me, but there's a difference here. But this industry is saying, nah, don't worry about that. Put on these five things that will absolutely get you to where you wanna be. But the problem that that we recognize with that is it doesn't really get us very far. I mean, think about this. If we looked at um, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit, and we said, okay, these are God's self-help way to be my, like Christ. Let's just, that's not what it is, but let's just pretend like it is. Okay, let's look at patience. <laughs> you ready for this? The last time any one of you said, I'm going to go out, I'm going to be real patient today. How'd it go for you? Did you come out saying, man, that was a success. I'm going to be patient with my spouse when I want to be on time to something, right? And I'm just going to, I'm going to put on that patient shirt today and I'm going for it. Did it work? Or for those of you that have young children, how did the patients go this morning on the way to church? Yeah, it's hard. I have a couple puppies at home. Patience is not a part of my life, right? It's, it's this thing of wanting to get in there, but we try and we fail. Okay, how about self-control? In the holiday season, 
There's another cookie on the plate. <laughs> it looks good. I can go after it. Or how many of you guys still have leftovers from Thanksgiving? Planning your Christmas meal? And it's like, it, it can just converge. It's hard, but we don't do super well when there's an extra cookie on the plate, right? Or there's still half of that Costco pumpkin pie in the fridge, let alone this. You walk into Target, really hard to be self-controlled in Target because they get you everywhere you go. Have you ever walked into Target and not walked out with something? Have you ever walked into Target and not walked out with something you didn't want? Right there. A, this whole crowd's like, oh yeah, I do that every day. That's a reality. We can't just try to add these things to our life. We have to recognize one big thing where Paul's leading us to. Yes, we are the sinful life, the flesh is crucified through the gospel, through what Jesus has done for us. And yes, there's this fruit, the Spirit's present, the presence of God that dwells in us that is so evident and so powerful. And what Paul's leading us towards is, I need you to not see the external act, but the internal presence of the, of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you want to understand growth, it's not about taking Galatians 22 and saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to be patient today. I'm going to be good today. I'm going to be kind today. It's about saying, Spirit, I need you today. I, I got to be on time to this thing and my family's coming. Spirit, I need you today. I'm feeling depleted and, and, and broken and, and I got to get in there and, 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 and be a, a business leader today. Spirit, I need you today. My family I've got this family member who's, who's dealing with this disease and, and I don't know what to say when I walk into that space. Spirit, I need you today. It's about recognizing the spirit of God in our lives. John 15, Jesus even says this, that I am the vine, you are the branches. The father is the gardener. So there's going to be things in your life that the gardener is going to have to cultivate and grow, but then there's going to be times that there's going to be some things that he's going to go hey, I, I'm going to prune this off so that you bear this fruit over here. And that's all coming from the presence and the work of Jesus in your life. But then Jesus goes on in chapter 16 and says that this work is happening, but I've got to go and prepare a place because I love you this much and we're going to do this life forever together. And I'm going to, while I'm gone, I'm leaving you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to counsel you. He's going to guide you. He's going to be with you at every step of the way. And when Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you, this is where he's leading us towards to understand the presence of him in us. And I love this thought. I say this all the time when I teach. Just dwell on that thought right there. That in Christ, if you are in Christ through his death and his resurrection, that the presence and the dwelling, the power and the glory of God is already in you. And maybe some of you just need to hear that. That if you are in Christ today, if you said, yes, Jesus, I want you today, that he has given you the spirit, that he is with you in everywhere you go, in every conversation, in every situation. When you need patience and goodness and kindness and joy, it's already a part of who you are because that is who the spirit is. And he's just, just waiting for that to come out of you. He's just waiting to say, oh, you, yeah, this is going to be a place where you're going to see my goodness come out of you. You're going to see my joy come out of you. Because it's about who he is, not who you are externally. And we need to live in a way that says, I want to put my attention on the spirit of God. Verse 24, Paul says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature. So here's another part of this. You're struggling with some area of sin in your life? Paul's reminding us that has been crucified with Christ. It is gone. Roman, it's, Romans 8 tells us that like, there's no condemnation in this anymore. It is gone. Now, there's just still this battle that's there. The enemy's going to try to lie to you and say, not really. Jesus isn't that powerful. Spirit's not going to be able to do anything with you in that. But that's a lie. We're going to have to wrestle through that day in and day out. It's like, I need to get these lies out. And I want to invite the power of the spirit that is already in me through Christ to be the one that speaks louder, to be the one that moves broader through and out of me. 
I can't do things externally to change that. But it's been crucified. And then if we live by the Spirit and we keep in step with the Spirit, God does incredible things. And so you walk through a sermon or a passage like this and you're like, hey, Jason, give us, like, how do I do that? Because that's hard. I mean, spirit's not necessarily a tangible being. He's not your, your buddy that's right there next to you that you can see. And a lot of the times it's not that you're hearing a, an audible voice in your life. And so it's, it's tough, isn't it? Like, yeah, we hear you talk about living and walking and being in step with the Spirit, but I don't know how to do that. And to be honest, I don't have a great answer for you. (laughs) I don't have five things that if you just do it this way, this is what it's going to become like. A lot of you guys may have a chair in your home that that you spend time with in every day, and that's your space with Jesus. A lot of you go, I love to go for walks. I don't do it enough. My doctor tells me I should do it more. But I love just to go for walks with Jesus, and like just it takes me about an hour to get all of the, the rhetoric in my head gone so I can actually spend time and hear Jesus. It takes a while. I don't do it enough, but I know I need to do it more. Maybe some of you are the exercise folks. And your time with Jesus is on a treadmill. That's awesome. Like, sweat it out of you. Like, go get it. But truly, when it comes to seeing the Spirit move, there's a few things we see through Scripture that are so evident. One, meditate on a day and night. Psalmist talks about this. Let this power and the presence of God's Word just be a part of who you are. When you just need to be refreshed and like spirit I, I need I need to know and be reminded here I'm just gonna I'm gonna come right back to your word and just let it resonate in you let it be spoken over you even if it's just I just need to open up my phone and turn on the bible app and just play it just play it I don't need to study the word that uh, this word or I need to study this thing or get through this I'm just gonna let the word just be spoken over me The Spirit of God speaking over you. Paul challenges us to pray without ceasing. Not just to pray before a meal, not just to to pray when you're in need, but just to continually have this conversation with the Spirit of God that's already dwelling in you. To be present with Him. I had a friend when she was in college She was going through this and trying to, like, what does this mean? How do I do this? And so she decided that... (laughs) really creative person. Like, she's probably one of the most creative people I know. And she decided that I think I need to remind myself in every moment of my life that God is with me. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to invite Jesus to come with me everywhere I go. And so she did. And so when she would get up and leave, she'd make Jesus breakfast. She'd have a bowl of cereal. She'd make him a bowl of cereal. (laughs) She's fun. A little crazy. Um, She would walk into a building. I kid you not, she would open the door, welcome Jesus through, and then follow him in. She would come to a restaurant or to the cafeteria at her school, and she would slide an extra chair out and then slide it in and would not let anybody sit there. Like, no, that seat's taken. What do you mean? There's no one there. No, Jesus is there. And she would sit down and have lunch. And this is one of my favorites. She would go out someplace with a friend (laughs) and she would uh, open the front passenger car door, which is super kind, right? Gentlemen, you should do that for your wife. I don't do it enough. You should do it with your wife. But she would open the door and welcome Jesus in the front seat and the friend would be like, oh, thanks. Like, no, 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 that's not for you. You need to get in the back seat. And she would close the door, walk her in the driver's seat and there's Jesus next to her and friends in the back seat, like early on Uber driver. But for her, the whole point was not to be seen as crazy, but to recognize that in every moment that God is always with me. And sometimes that might come across as a crazy thought. But where are we welcoming the Spirit to walk with us and to be present with us? And for her, she found that as just one creative way to be reminded day in and day out that the Spirit's with me. And this is exactly where the growth comes from. Because remember, it's something that already dwells in us, that God has given us. And then out of that, 
comes the joy and the goodness. Out of that work of Jesus, the sinful nature starts to fall away. And then when there's the residue of that, the power and the presence of God in these ways starts dealing with that residue. And growth is the result. So I don't have a five-step plan for you this morning about like, if you want to grow in, in your walk with Jesus today, here, do these five things. I have one thing for you. Be aware that the Spirit of God dwells in you when you are in Christ. The gospel has made that possible. When Jesus died on the cross, do you know what happened? Well, a bunch of things happened. But one really incredible thing happened. The curtain in the temple tore in two. The curtain that separated all of the people that came to temple from the presence and the glory of God as they saw it in that place. The death of Christ gave us access to the glory of God. You were welcomed into the presence of God. And then when Jesus rose from the dead, he gave you freedom. And even Paul says, you were called to this freedom. He gave you freedom to be in this presence of God eternally. And we just need to recognize and know and be aware that that presence of God exists in us because of what Jesus did for us. And the gardener is going to do the work within us because it's already there. So if you're sitting here and you're like, I, I'm not super self-controlled, Jason. If you're in Christ, you are. I don't have a whole, I'm not a patient person. If you're in Christ, you are. I wasn't super good that day. Well, you, you, you fell into that one, but in Christ, you are good. Do you see where that is? We need to see that in us, not because it's who we are, because of, but more the who he is in us. And growth is going to expound from that. Paul starts this section of his letter out to saying, the fulfillment of the law is loving others. Jesus was a fulfillment of law, and he loved us in the greatest way possible. He died on the cross for us, and he rose from the dead to give us eternity with him. As a result of the spirits in us, we bear fruit, the fruit of the spirit. Here's an interesting thing about fruit. The fruit given from a tree, to use that as an illustration, isn't meant for the tree. It seeds new trees or new plants, whatever it may be, and it feeds others. As you recognize and are aware of the spirit in you, and you say, spirit, I just need you to be part of this, and I need... I want, you to, I want you to be so here. I recognize you here. I come to you. The Spirit's going to bear that fruit and through you. This is how God loves you. Through you. You're going to feed others and you're going to see others come to know Jesus because of the Spirit in you. If that's not growth, I don't know what is. You're already these things. Just be aware of the Spirit in you. Welcome Him in to this place. Paul recognizes something else here. This is the last verse. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Because I think once we can get in this rhythm, in step with the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, walking with the Spirit every day, when we open our eyes up to this place, the enemy works some things. He's like, well, you got it going on. Now you need to make all these other people do what you do. And so in ways, when you feel like I got this down, and so everyone should be living like me, or everyone should be living like this, and it just turns into another form of the law. If you do it this way, if you do it that way, this is the, how it works. If you, and Paul's just encouraging and challenging us. Don't let this go to your head when you see the Spirit come alive in you. Don't let it become this place where you're conceited or provoking or, or going, ah, oh, I just want to be like, I can never be like that person. Don't let that become the lie and the law in your life. But continue to go after it. Spirit, I need you here. I'm hearing this lie in my head. Spirit, I need you here. 
I need you to, I need you to stretch that muscle. I know you're already in me. And I need that patience right now, Spirit. I know it's there, but I just need it now. I need that goodness in me. I know it's there, and I need it now. Continue to go to the presence of the Spirit of God in your life. And that's exactly where growth comes from. It's a quality that's already within you. (laughs) Think about that for a moment. Isn't that a good word? I don't know how what you came into this service today <laughs> feeling like. But maybe some of you came in and like, that's not how I felt. I didn't feel good. I didn't feel like I was kind to my family. I didn't feel real patient. But God loves you so much that he gave you all of that, that it's in you. He looks at a broken vessels like us. <laughs> I marvel at this all the time, that he looks like a, at a broken vessel like me. And he still sees me as a place that he wants to dwell in. And that blows my mind. God, why would you ever want to dwell in me? And I believe it's because he sees something in me I'm not sure in my humanity I will ever see. But then he also sees something in me so I can do things through you. Greater things, and Paul writes in Ephesians, than you can ask or imagine is for you. So church, I don't know where you came from today or what you came in this room with, but the spirit of God in Christ dwells in you. He is shaping and growing you from the inside out. And I'm inviting you just to say, spirit, be present. When I'm not aware, make me aware. When I'm at that greatest point of need, Remind me that all I have to do is not try to do six, five, six things to make it better, but just to fall on my knees and say, Spirit, I know you're here. Walk me through it. The band's gonna come out and we're gonna sing the song that's asking specifically this, making ourselves aware. And I I just believe in this season that we're gonna see the Spirit of God move. Even in one of the last songs we just sang that, One of the names of Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And this whole season through Christmas, we are reminded of that. And I pray that that's something we're not just reminded when there's Christmas trees on the stage. We're reminded that every day of our lives, Emmanuel, God with us. One of my favorite parts of the Christmas story is when Mary prays and and reflects on all that is going on around her the Bible often listed as Mary's Magnificat. When she comes to this place and she realizes that the power and the presence of God is so much in and around her, and her response is like, I gotta, I gotta get my stuff together. Like, I gotta figure this all out. Mary's response was simply this, may it be, Lord, who am I that you'd ever dwell in me? Who am I that you'd ever do this work for me? Her response is one of praise and response to the presence of God in her life. And church, may that be ours today. That growth comes from within. Not because of what you will, but because of his presence already in you.